Right, so last week we looked at suffering. Um, can you just turn this microphone down a little bit? It's a bit, I know I like feedback, but sometimes this is more than I... That was a second joke. Um, okay, <laughs> why God allows it. And um, we looked at this idea, and I've put the word crave in there. When tragedy strikes, we often crave to know why. It's, it's not always the case, uh, but quite often when something really awful happens... Why did this happen? And on Friday morning, just two days ago, when I, was, I sat down to sort of prepare the last bit of this talk, I got an email uh, about uh, this, this family that, that I know-ish, um, not very well, but their 17-year-old son was skateboarding um, on Thursday, three days ago, and had an accident such that his life was ended. Um, and... I just couldn't believe it. I, I certainly couldn't do any more preparation. I just, I just, what? How? Why? And uh, I was literally swearing. Now, you might think Christians shouldn't swear, but I'm of the opinion that when something's really bad, we can use bad words to describe how we feel and what that is. And I just was, I was like, no, 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 as I thought about the implications and the ramifications of all this. Um, and then I thought, would what I had said last Sunday, does it hold up in light of what's just happened? You know, does this family need to actually know why that tragedy happened? Or do they need to know God in this tragedy? Um, and that's what we were looking at because and I'll bring that again in a second, but Job and his friends, his friends for seven days sat there in silence, and I think that's sometimes the best thing we can do when somebody is suffering. Just be with them. But at some point, those, seven, those three friends tried to explain and make sense of the why Job was suffering. And they basically had one rhetoric, which was, if you're suffering, that's because you sinned. And if you sinned, you need to repent. And if you repent, the suffering will stop. Now, while that can be true in certain circumstances, a lot of times it's not directly true. And so they said this in many poetic and terrific ways, but really Job kept saying, look, I can't repent for sin that I haven't sinned. That would be a sin in itself. So they were left in this stalemate until finally God turns up. And what does God do? God says to Job, Job, have a look at the vastness of this universe. Are you the one who causes the sun to rise? Are you the one who stretches out the skies? You know, he, he asks Job question after question, which Job hasn't the foggiest clue how to answer. And then Job, at the end of this, says, You know what, God? <laughs> I had heard of you before, but now I've seen you. And Job basically is saying to us this. I realize I don't need an answer. You know, why did I have to open the car door at that moment? Why did I have to get into the car? Door? Why did I even have the idea of going? You know, that never helps. What we need is an encounter with the living God. A, because our brains could never grasp the complexities of free will <laughs> and a free planet and how suffering happens. And secondly, even if God could explain it to you, how would it help to comfort you? You'd be left with an answer. But what you need as a human being is an encounter, not an answer. And we looked at this as a church also when we're comforting those who are suffering. Rarely, even though they ask the question why, rarely do they want a logical answer. Normally what they want is an encounter. In Madagascar, there was this tradition where the, when somebody was grieving, the, the Malagasis would just come and sit and cry with them. And not offer any answers. <laughs> and when I was leading the Mustard Tree Church, and I got a, a phone call from this mother, and she said, this is probably the worst thing I'll ever have to say. She said, my son was on a motorbike at 3 a.m. last night, coming back from work in Bath. He overtook a, a taxi. A taxi stopped hurriedly on this back road, middle of nowhere, to, to let somebody be sick out the door. He went around the, overtook around a blind, blind corner because he couldn't stop in time. A car came. And that was the end of his life. And 
we opened up the church for all his mates of, of all, and, you know, random people we didn't know just to come and just to be. Because we knew that they didn't want answers. They wanted to just be with. They wanted to cry through this stuff. Nobody had a simple answer. Why did he have to be following the car at that moment? They wanted encounter. I went on to meet with his brother for about five years, six years. I'm still in touch with him. And, um, I mean, his story is a, a wonderful story in itself. But it, it, it's a story of how God met with him in incredible ways. Um, just very, very briefly, after two years of having lost his brother, he was in such a state that he actually was about to take his life. And I had been, I didn't know this, but I was meeting with him regularly, and he told me a lot, but he didn't tell me everything, because some things are just too horrid to tell even another human being, and uh, he never told me this. And I, as a leader of the church, I, I said to the youth worker, uh, Susan, I said, why don't we invite Nathan to help out with the young people? And for whatever reason, she didn't do anything about it for about a month. And then I, it came to me again, and I said to her, Susan, invite Nathan to join in with the youth work and to help as a leader. Uh, he was about 18 at the time, I suppose. And she phoned him up that day, uh, that, that Friday, and said, will you help me on Sunday with the youth club? And he said yes. And he came along on that Sunday. And about six months later, I said to Nathan one time in our chats with, together, I said, how do you know God exists? And he said because I was planning to take my life on a Sunday. And on that Friday, Susan came to me and said, would you help with the youth work? And because of that, I helped out with the youth work. And I'm still alive today. That's how he knew God was, 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 was real. So let's never underestimate what God can bring out of suffering. But let's remember that what we primarily offer and what God off offers also, like Janet was saying with her prayer, we come to a God who knows and f is familiar with suffering. And therefore, as God's people, we need to courageously be willing to suffer with each other because we know a God who suffers. That is our God. We're not a God. We don't serve a God who is distant. We don't serve a God who's full of pat answers. We serve a God who's familiar with suffering. And the more we can sit with people in the midst of their suffering, the more we encounter God in that time. So that was last week. Now this week, we're looking particularly at how God helps us. Now there's loads of ways. Of course I can't cover all these. I want to bring up something that's particular. And that is something that the Jewish people were introduced to, well, I don't know when, long, but the Psalms, a, a quarter of the Psalms uh, use this. And I think it's amazing. So let's look at this. We know how to praise and worship God. The question is, can we relate to God in our pain, our anger, our blame, and our fear? Okay. Because that's what we're trying to learn as a congregation, as God's people. Most of the songs we sing from the front are written about praising God and lifting his name up, which is terrific and is so helpful. But that's not the whole story of life. Life throws awful things at us. And the question is, as Christians, how do we together come to God when things really are bad? We have to have an answer, and we do have an answer to that. But I think as Christians, we, don't always, we haven't always realized this. I hadn't realized this until I went to Trinity College to train at uh, the Bible College there. I'd never really come across this, amazingly. I'd been through 20 years of church, and I'd never come across the fact <laughs> that the Jewish people, and therefore us Christians, have a wealth of ways of coming to God in the pain, not just in the praise. And this is how it is. It's something called lament. It's a prayer expressing sorrow, pain, or confusion. On Friday, I was literally sitting there, and I was speaking to somebody who was, who was, at the, um, who was helping out on Friday. And she said to me, how do you decide what to say on a Sunday morning? I said, well, I, you know, I, I let the Bible, we try to open up the Bible. I said, for example, last week we looked at suffering. Why does God allow suffering? And then this week, we're looking at the role that music and song can take. 
And I literally got that far, and she was in tears. She welled up in tears. We had to stop the conversation. Somebody got some tissues for her. And uh, she was just, she took about a minute to compose herself. And then she said, you know, four years ago, to this day, ironically, which I, I, I say ironically, but I mean, God's in everything. You know, but to that day, to Friday, whatever, four years ago, she had hit an incredible low in her mental health. Uh, I don't know what, what that was, and she didn't explain it. It didn't really matter. But the, the, the point was, she suffered massively. And what she said got her through was this one particular song which she played on re repeat again and again and again for six months. And she said, can I play you the song? And, and she played it to me. And it was a powerful song about saying how I will rise up despite what's going on. And that's why she was in tears. And I said, well, that's interesting because the Jewish people and us as Christians have a way of using music to bring to the surface the pain and the anger and the questions that we have as, as people towards God. And in doing that, there can be healing and there can be restoration. And uh, I was just amazed how this, this works. So um, this is what somebody has said, and, and I would agree with it. I don't know if you will, but maybe by the end of this talk, you'll be more convinced. Lament should be the chief way Christians process grief in God's presence. Lament, as we're going to look at in this psalm, which Roger's already read, is this way of corporate, often corporately expressing our pain and anger and frustration and why at God, but doing it together and often to music because music moves the heart. And this is what some people have said should be the chief way that we uh, as Christians process this. So this is what we're going to do. We're just going to look at Psalm 13 briefly. The psalm is in three parts, so I'm going to speak about the first part, and then we're going to sing a song, literally, about, kind of about that, and then, then Roger's going to share a lament that he wrote, just to kind of help that to bed in. Then we're going to the second part and the third part. The second and the third part will be much shorter, so take heart. <laughs> um, so two things to notice before we even look at Psalm 13. One is, this was written by David, possibly one of the greatest, you know, he, he knew God like few people know. So if you're thinking, hang on a minute, I'm not, too com I'm not happy with what's being said, just remember these are David's words, not mine. And secondly, it's for the director of music. So this is designed to be sung, not just said. Okay? So this is what we want, is to, is, is, to sing it together, like that girl uh, said, you know, music literally got her through. So here's the psalm. I don't know if you'll be able to read it uh, just about, but I'm going to read it out out loud for us again. You can see immediately I've put it into three sections. The first one we're looking at just now is this, the pain section. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? I mean, these are incredible words. Have you ever said to God that you think he's forgotten you? Have you ever said to God that you think he's hiding his face from you. Though that, that takes courage. Some people would say, well, that's not faith. You should believe through this. You should never doubt or question God. Well, David is expressing this for us, and there must be a reason why he's doing this. How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Here's some pictures which I think kind of capture the three sections of the psalm. We're not going to, uh, I'm going to just do the first part now and then the second, part two and part three in a minute. But that in some ways is how we can summarize this psalm, those three images. We start with that, but we don't end with it. <laughs> but unless we start with it, we never express and bring to the surface that which is deep hidden in our hearts. And I would suggest that if we don't deal with it, if we don't allow it to come out, it still remains there and it will affect how we relate to each other and how we relate to God. But just we won't have faced it. Then we come to prayer, the second one, and finally we come to praise, the third one. So let's just look at this lament briefly and then we're going to literally sing a song just to give us the chance to engage with this. How long will you forget me? Will you forget me? You know, did David really think 
<laughs> that the God he knew, who had helped him conquer Goliath and all the rest of it, and with Saul and almost being killed so many times, you know, all, did he really think God would forget him? I don't know. I, I, I don't really know. But he gives us the words to express that very same sentiment. Because when you're in the midst of pain, you often don't feel God is very present or very obvious. You often think, where are you? And David not just tells us that's okay to feel that, he literally gives us words in case we don't dare say it ourselves. Will you forget me forever? We were talking about this in, about two months ago in our home group. We went through this same psalm. And it, and it dawned on somebody, and, and th as we did it, that actually to be able to say this to God <laughs> is not a sign of lack of faith. It's a sign of being confident that you can say this to God without God saying, Right, you're out. If you really think I've forgotten you, you can get out. You're not a real Christian. You can't question me. Actually, we can. We can. David did. Job did. <laughs> and God is big enough to absorb our punches. Think about this in the context of a family. I one time had a, a, a Sunday lunch with this family. And we sat down at Sunday lunch. It was m me and, and the, the father and the mother. And then one of the sons was there, a guy called Ryan. And when he sat there, he was rigid. He was totally polite. He was absolutely impeccable mannered. And I thought, man, I feel very uncomfortable about this. Wh why? This is it. You're the son here. And yet you're acting like you've never been it. You know, you're not, you're on your best behavior. It felt like a family where you just couldn't put a foot wrong. And I thought, actually, something's not right there. That a son is so rigid in the presence of his parents because he doesn't dare put a foot wrong in case he gets consequences that he can't bear to face. And that's a point and example, but I think it's an important one. That actually, when we know our parents well, <laughs> there should be that courage somehow to, to actually say when we're not happy. <laughs> and that's hard, I know. I'm touching on, on difficult things. And I, I guess I prayed that God would guide me. And, and I think if I'm stirring things up, it's that not that it's necessarily resolved today. But I, I want to bring things to the surface. And then may God help us to work through these things. Nobody has a perfect family. It would be ridiculous to think of a family as being perfect. A family can only be healthy, and a healthy family has space to do this. Now, I don't think I ever questioned my parents. I, I, I never rebelled against them. I, I never felt the desire to. My sister did, and that's a whole different issue. Um, but um, I can see now that actually it doesn't always help to just keep things under, under, bottle, or under wraps. And in our faith with God, somehow we need the courage together. <laughs> you see, this is what this lament would have done. It would have been a song that everybody sang together so that, if, so that we're all in it together. We're all expressing our pain, our, our angst to God together. Knowing that's not the end of the song, that's, but that's where the song starts. So that's my second point. It's the doing it together. You know, somebody told me that when you're comforting somebody who's in raw pain, the sort of thing that these parents of this boy who passed away on Thursday would be feeling right now, raw pain, right? Pain where you, you've lost your appetite, you feel sick, you feel raw. When you're comforting a person like that, sometimes the best thing to do is help them make their case against God, to express it, to explain it, to, to give them words. Do you feel angry? Do you feel disappointed? Do you feel like, why, this is unfair? Let me give you words to express that. That's what the psalmist is doing. 
How long will you forget us forever? Why would you allow this accident to happen? Literally giving them words to express it to God. God is big enough to absorb our anger and our punches. Have you not seen a three-year-old temper tantrum? And have you not seen a loving parent who doesn't try to say, listen, kid, this is not my fault. Grow up. No, no, no. A loving parent doesn't do that. A loving parent absorbs those punches and lets the child just get it out of their system. Why, daddy, can't I go? Why, why, why can't I go? Or maybe it's a teenager. <laughs> why are you stop me doing this? And they just absorb that pain. Because they know that once the pain has been expressed, then the prayer will come. This is not easy stuff this morning, and I'm not. But we're in it together. This is what God invites us to. And lastly, oh, letting others into your grief, your questions, your doubts. Now this is just, after this we're going to sing, I think, as far as I can remember. So if God didn't cause the pain... <coughs> David understands that God is still sovereign over it. I, for one, am not one who believes that God causes bad things. Imagine you fall down the stairs and you end up in hospital. Did God push you down the stairs? Well, I'm not happy with that because like Janet prayed, the God we, the God we worship is a God of infinite love. So I'm not happy with saying that God pushed me down the stairs. I do know that God is with me, next to me, in the hospital bed. And I do know that God allows this to happen at times. So God's still sovereign. He's not thrown by it. He's not thinking, oh my goodness, I never saw that coming. Oh no, I, I don't know what we're going to... No, no, no. God saw it coming. He gives space for it. So somehow God isn't the, the cause of it. You know, Adam and Eve... Eve taking the apple, or whatever fruit it was, God didn't make her do it, but there was space for her to, and him to eat the apple, or the fruit, and cause the, suffer the consequences of it, and then God's there, picking up the pieces. Okay, so God doesn't cause, I, I don't feel happy with saying that God causes our suffering, but certainly God allows it, and certainly God is with us in it. And certainly God is sovereign. He's not thrown by this. You can still come to God and say, why did this happen, God? Because after all, God is the one who's going to bring good out of it. Right? So he's not thrown by it. As far as I know, we're going to sing. So now, you're left with a lot of questions. <laughs> and that's exactly where we're left with at this point of this lament. So that's where we start, but then we go on to prayer. So we've talked about pain and the courage of expressing that pain ruthlessly, being as real as we can about how painful it feels. That's where it starts, <laughs> but that's not where it ends. And the more we can do that with reality, the more we pray with a real heart. Because I don't know about you, but the prayers that come from the depths of who you are. I mean, that's often when we, we know when we've prayed in that way. It's not just good words, whatever. It's, ah! So, this is what David's saying. Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. The first thing I think to say is that we need church to bring each other to a place of prayer. What do I mean by this? What I mean is that often when, when one is suffering and in a painful place, they find it hard to even communicate to God. They will, especially if they haven't heard about what they can do in verse 1 and 2. They think they only have to praise God and they can't praise God because what's happened is just so awful. And that's often when we need other Christians just to put into words what we're praying and, and to bring that prayer to God. So just an example. Tuesday morning, it was a Tuesday morning, I was dressed to take a funeral of a, an elderly man who had passed away, sort of related to our church, but not, not closely, whatever. And I got this phone call from um, 
a lady called Sally. She's 65, uh, and uh, she said, Trevor, please pray. Trevor, well, the paramedics are here, uh, but he seems to have gone. He was also 65. And then I quickly sent a message to those. There literally was a prayer meeting at that time online in, in my church. Sent a message to them. They were immediately praying. And then I got a message from Sally saying they can't bring him. They can't do anything about him. Um, he's gone. I mean, <laughs> this is a guy who woke up in the morning. She went down to get breakfast for him. Came up and, and he had gone. And, uh, and that was that. And literally on the way to this funeral that I was taking, I, I, I dropped in on Sally. And by then, her daughter-in-law and son and whatever else were there. Um, and, um, I mean, wh wh what do you say? You know, <laughs> well, hopefully you don't give answers. You, you, like we said, you know, you're just there with the people. But at the end, I just said, would you mind if I just prayed uh, uh, and just bring this pain and these questions to God? And so Sally was there. She's a lovely, lovely relationship with God. She said, yes, of course. And her daughter-in-law was there who, um, I, I don't know that she knows God much at the time. And I just said, Father, you can see our pain and our questions. And this lady was blown away. She was like, she said to Sally later, you know, he spoke like he was speaking to his own father. <laughs> Which I was. But she had never thought of God in that way. <laughs> And she, she had just lost a father-in-law, and here I was talking to somebody who, who knew about all this, and yet somehow was still our father. And that's just one of many examples of how prayer is a gift at this time of pain. Not with trite and simple or sort of like help us to be brave. You know, not that. No, no, no. If you're going to pray, be honest about where people are at, for, for goodness sake. But pray, because people need, when they are suffering in that way, they are incredibly vulnerable. They need to know that there's a way that at least somebody is able to connect with the living God at this moment and able to somehow hold the living God and this horrible situation together, even if there's no simple answers. And I have found that it is during suffering that people could go fall from God, uh, you know, they could, could, could struggle in what they believe about God, or they could grow amazingly. And a lot of that is down to how we, the church, support them in that time. Because it's a time for potential massive growth in a person's faith, if we can express it and put it to words. So that's the first thing to say about prayer. The second thing would be just this, if it'll work. Um, can you just do the second one, Stuart, please? Uh, not that, the second, it should be the next animation. Oh, there it is. Prayer, in a nutshell, this is the way I think prayer works. And, it, and this is very simplistic, but I hope this analogy is helpful to you. In prayer, we take what is causing the, the nub of our pain, and prayer is about bringing it to Jesus and then just leaving it with him. The powerful example of this is Mary at the wedding of Cana. Remember that? She comes to Jesus, her son, <laughs> the son of God, and says, they have no more wine. There's the issue. There's the pain. There's the... And just leaves it with him. Now it's his problem. Now it's Jesus' problem. <laughs> and Jesus says, why do you in <laughs> involve me, woman? It's not my time. And that's another whole issue. But... Mary knows that he's taking it, taking it upon himself. And then Mary says to the servants, do whatever he says. In other words, I've shared the problem with God. Now let's see what's going to happen. That, in essence, is prayer. And sometimes we do it for each other, bringing the pain, the issue, and leaving it at the feet of Jesus and saying, God, I can't carry this pain. You're going to get some of it. And lastly, I've just taken this one sentence. I know it's two sentences, but it'll take a whole day if I keep going on. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. Now that might sound a bit over the top. 
But this is a prayer where David realizes that unless God gets involved, unless the way things are going, they're going to keep unraveling until there's nothing to live for anymore. And therefore, David says, Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. There's no part, plan B. There's no sort of like, well, if this doesn't happen, I can always phone the insurance company. You know, th there's no other plan, God. You've got to do something. And I'm leaving it in your hands. They are capable hands. So we're going to sing now a song, a second song. Oh Lord, hear our prayer. And in this, maybe we can just bring the unsolvable, whether that be Gaza, whether that be our own lives, whether that be somebody we know, and leave it in the hands of Jesus and just say, God, unless you do something, our lives will continue to unravel and I will sleep in death. So therefore, it's over to you. Wow. Well, that leads very naturally into this third and a very brief thing, which is praise. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. This is an incredible place to come to, bearing in mind where we just were <laughs> four verses ago. But this is the trajectory that... This is why we have the courage to go there in the first place, because we know that is never the end of the story. Like Janet said, we may be suffering, but it's never the end of the story. You know, and, and because we know it's not the end, because we know the end of the story, we have the courage to be honest about how bad the story feels at the moment. Does that make sense? So this is praise. I trust in your unfading love. Let me just say this and I really will try to be brief. Uh, there, thank you. Unfailing love. I trust in your unfailing love. Does God love us because we are lovable or because he is love? Let's just unpack that for a moment. So much of our lives, we are rewarded or punished for how we are. That it makes us think, that that's maybe why God loves us, because we are lovable. There's something at least redeeming about us. I'm not saying there's not. What I'm trying to say is that it's much more powerful to understand that God loves us, not really primarily because there's something about John Mark that's just kind of catchy and kind of sweet, but because God is the source of love. It's like walking outside into that sunshine and saying, is this sun shining on me because I'm indeed a great person or because the nature of sun, the sun is to shine. That is the nature of the sun. The very nature, you know, love has a source and he is God himself. Love comes from God. God is the source of love and he rains love on us, not primarily because we're such great people. Primarily because he's a God who loves. Isn't that how parenting should be? And isn't it how it often is? We, we love our children even though they cause us pain. We still love them. Because we don't love them just because they got blue eyes. We love them because we love them. They draw the love out of us. We love them. And therefore, although they cause us pain, in fact, some of the pain we feel is precisely because we love them, <laughs> but that's not, that doesn't change us. This is so, so important. Because if you think God only loves you because you've done some good stuff and you've attended church for 35 years and you should get a certificate for doing that, you've missed the point. God loves you because he is love. This really, really helps. Because when I do stuff that I can't have the courage to share with other people because it's not the sort of thing that a church leader should do, and if I think, does God still love me? I need to know that God loves me because he's the source of love, not because I've managed to live a squeaky clean life. 
We need to soak in this. God is love. That's why he loves us. So when I think, oh, God doesn't love me because of what I've done, hang on. That hasn't stopped the sun shining, has it? That can't change the nature of God, can it? No, God's love is still his nature. Yes, he's hurt by what you've done. Now, this is the stuff, just very, very briefly, the stuff of the prodigal son. This is the stuff of the prodigal son. Because the older son says, Father, what are you doing? This son squandered your wealth. You're, you know, the, 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 the farm that you worked hard to, he squandered it on prostitutes. And you're, you're, you're saying, let's celebrate? What is there to celebrate? And the father says, but this guy was lost. He was dead. Now he's found. Now he's alive. Don't you see that the prodigal father, that the father <laughs> is recklessly lavish with his love? It's the older son who has a problem with it. Hang on a minute, man. He squandered it on prostitutes of all people. How can you, a good Jew, accept this? Oh, absolutely. As a good Jew, I couldn't. <laughs> but because I'm the source of love. <laughs> it's not to say that that's not awful. It's to say that it's worse than that. He was dead. Now he's alive. This is the stuff of love. It's not to say that our sins don't matter. It's to say that it's worse than just our sins. It's to say that we're in danger of not even knowing the source of love unless we realize that the source of love envelops us in order to love us and to then bring change in us. Grace is a much more powerful motivation for change than mercy or judgment. I'm sharing a lot, and I'm sorry. I am probably said too much. I should have had clearer notes, and that would have stopped me. But anyway, last thing, and then I really will stop. Praise. Think about when you praise things. Naturally, when you praise things. You step outside, and there's beautiful sunlit morning, and you say, wow, and you call somebody that you know and love, and you say, look at that. Now, why did you, why did you do that? Did somebody tell you, you should be praising the sun? No, no, no. You saw the beauty of the sun shine, the, 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 the sun, the, 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 let's say the sunset. And you naturally wanted to share it with somebody else. Somehow, when you see it and you're not with somebody, you take a picture and you post it on Facebook, whatever. You, know, you, you want to share it. <laughs> you don't just want to praise the sun. Obviously, the sun doesn't actually hear what you're saying. But... You want to praise it, but you also want to share that praise with other people. This is the natural thing that you do when you realize how wonderful something or someone is. You want to praise them, and you want to praise them to others. This is a point I got from C.S. Lewis. I wish I thought of it myself, but I think it, it is true. It literally makes us more human. When you go out there and you recognize the beauty of the sunset... And you praise it. You, 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 you are becoming more alive. <laughs> and when you share it, 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 somehow it completes that enjoyment. So when God invites us to praise him, it's not because he's some egocentric thing in the sky. It's because he knows that's what's going to help us to become more human and enjoy the nature of God. God, I want to praise you. Because I've seen that you're in this pain. I've seen that you're the answer to this pain. I've seen that you've borne even more than this pain on your own shoulders. And I just can't stop praising you and grabbing anybody else who's near me and saying to them, have you seen who God is? <laughs> He's the God who's worthy of praise. 